A very good morning to whoever is present here and greetings to everyone. So today we hold the pleasure in bringing you another amazing model rocketry workshop. I'm the moderator for the day. I'm Hassan and and I'm Shanta and I'll be moderating this event with Hassan. The second workshop of the webinar series organized by the SETS chapter of Sri Lanka Technological Campus in collaboration with the SETS chapter of University of Moratua. The first webinar series was held in March 2021. It consisted of five workshops which covered the basics in model three. Winners of the competition held in the end of the first workshop series will be announced soon and they'll be selected to the Ceylon 1.0 team. They'll be having a chance to participate in competitions such as SA Cup, which is the world's largest intercollegiate rocket engineering competition. Also, you can leave the past workshops on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Over to you, Hassan. Yes, Shanta. <laughs> Also, please do note that this session is live on Sri Lanka Technological Campus SED's FB page. And uh, without further ado, why don't we dive into the session? So as usual, we have a very special guest who is not new, but really familiar person, Mr. Josh Frizzle. So Josh Frizzle is an experienced professional of practicing rocketry for 30 years from Lowell, Indiana, he went to Lowell High School in 1996. He studied environmental geology at Indiana State, and also he is the former geologist at Arcades. Mr. Josh is a NAR certified rocketry teacher. He is certified by the National Association of Rocketry, a certifying body in the USA for level two high power rocketry. So welcome, sir. And uh, so this time goes to welcoming every, each and every participant we have here with us today. So this invitation goes to one of the project chairman, Pasindu Hatharasingha, for the delivery of welcome speech. Okay, thank you, Aya. Uh, I'm audible. Yes, you are audible. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm Pasindu Hatharasingha, the one of project chairman of the SETS Progress to Workshop Series 2. It is great pleasure and honor. I welcome all of you to our webinar on how to design and manufacture fiberglass models. To begin with, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. George Fisher from the US to this webinar. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I would also like to welcome Dr. Namda Gunavardana, the advice of SLDC and Mr. Ushan Sakunta, the president of SEDS SLTC. Lahirudana, the president of SEDS Mora, all the board members and committee members of SEDS SLTC and SEDS Mora. Last but not least, my heartfelt welcome goes to each and everyone present here today to gain knowledge and to make this webinar success. I hope this webinar will be very beneficial to all our space enthusiastic participants. So again, welcome all of you and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pasindu. So with that warm welcome, why don't we go into the session? So without any further ado, Mr. Josh, I call upon you and the session is in your hands. Sir. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I will uh, share my screen. I have some slides to go through with you. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that okay. And, yes, sir, we can see the slides. Right, great. So uh, it's good to be back. Uh, my third time with SEDS, it's been uh, a pleasure and I appreciate the invitation back. And this topic was uh, a request. So that's great to have some active uh, interest showing up here. Um, so we're talking about fiberglass construction for rockets. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, safety aspects, materials that we're going to need how to do it, things to watch out for that can uh, go wrong and hopefully everything we, that you need to know to get it to go right, make a nice solid rocket. Um, so first of all, uh, let's start from the very beginning. What is fiberglass? Well, 
once we produce our rocket, we've got our airframe, it's a composite. So we have two components, the fiberglass itself, which is actually a very fine thread. So in its, in its raw form, I'm gonna, hopefully the camera will pick this up, but it's just this very fine thread. You know, we think of glass as, you know, a pane of glass that's very fragile, brittle, you know, breaks easily, but fiberglass, it's drawn into a very fine th thread. It's actually very pliable and very soft. Uh, so it's these little tiny fibers, little tiny glass strings, okay? That's the fiberglass, the raw fiberglass itself. It's actually very soft. Uh, the other component is the liquid epoxy. So we, we combine this very soft fiberglass thread with the liquid epoxy. The epoxy cures and hardens. The two components together are very strong. Neither of them alone is very strong at all, but when we combine them, we get a really nice, robust material to make rockets out of. All right, so advantages of fiberglass. One, it's, it's tough and it's impact resistant. So it'll take a hit, it'll take a beating. Uh, if we have a rocket that we want to fly multiple times and make a rocket that's fully reusable, it's a really good material to do that. Um, another nice thing about it is what I have here is the catastrophic failure behavior. In other words, if we have, say, a motor explode. Fiberglass will usually fail at one point. Maybe it'll blow a hole in the side of the airframe, but generally the airframe will stay together in contrast to something like PVC plastic pipe, which will explode into sharp shards and send shrapnel flying. So um, the fiberglass is good from a durability standpoint and also a safety standpoint. Uh, disadvantages are the cost compared to something like, you know, the cardboard and wood construction that we've talked about in some of the, the past uh, sessions we've done. And the weight, it tends to be heavy compared to cardboard and, and plywood. Um, very heavy, you know, compared to something like carbon fiber, All right? But um, really good material to make rockets out of for the, for the durability. The durability to weight ratio is really good with fiberglass, okay? I wanna briefly talk about the differences between um, fiberglass that you would get in a kit and fiberglass that we would lay up and produce at home ourselves. So this session is mostly going to be about the latter, you know, the fiberglass that we're going to produce ourselves at home. But I want to briefly talk about the kits, um, mostly because I see, you know, a, as it's been already been mentioned in the introduction, a really strong competitive spirit in this group, which is great. Um, SEDS recently ran a virtual rocket design competition, which I had the opportunity, thank you, to uh, review some of the entries. They were very strong, very well thought out. So. I'm um, seeing some, uh, you know, a strong, like I said, competitive spirit in this group. And I just want to briefly touch on the kit because like, let's say, for example, you know, you wanted to compete internationally. It might be logistically challenging to build a gigantic rocket, something that's going to compete at, say, for example, the Spaceport America Cup. And, you know, you build this big rocket and you're like, oh, okay, you know, I have this, you know, I'm going on an international flight. Like, I can take this as my carry-on item, right? You know, I mean, this the travel, the logistics would be a challenge. So with a fiberglass kit, they actually are, they're very durable, but they're pretty easy to put together. I mean, an experienced builder could assemble one of these things with wisely chosen epoxies, structural epoxies in a day. You know, a team of people could definitely do it in a day as far as completing the basic airframe construction. So just food for thought. I mean, that's something you might consider if you're gonna to try to compete internationally. If you had some connections in the host country, you could, you know, if you had your payload and everything all ready to go, show up and assemble the rocket on site, you know, or, you know, at, in, in the host country, if, if you had to. So a um, little bit of the differences between what you'd get in a kit and what you'd get doing it yourself, making your own fiberglass. So if we look at the body tube, at the photo on the left, that is made from a kit. So that is actually, that's this guy uh, before the paint job, right? That's what it looked like. That's the raw fiberglass. And if you look closely, you can see on that, uh, the body tube, the cylindrical part, uh, it's that very fine glass fiber that we talked about. And it's on, you know, some specialized equipment. This would occur in a factory as opposed to something you do at home but that very fine glass thread is wound around a mandrel with some, some epoxy um, and it's 
wound in a diagonal pattern. So it's kind of woven, it makes a nice structure. But uh, that's what you would see uh, coming from a kit is that filament wound. It's taking that little fiber and it's winding it with a, with a machine around a mandrel, something that gives it its shape. The fins there are made of fiberglass sheet or fiberglass plate, which at, you know, at a factory, they have taken sheets of the fiberglass fabric, stacked it up several layers thick, probably cured it at high temperature in an oven, possibly under vacuum or under pressure. And they end up with this very strong fiberglass plate. So again, this one, for example, uh, this is from a kit. So they've taken this fiberglass fabric, stacked it up several layers thick. And then we end up, these fins are about five millimeters thick, solid fiberglass. So I mean, they're, they're very solid, very strong. Um, but that's, that's what you'd expect from a kit. But again, once you have these parts in a kit, it's a matter of some epoxy. You can assemble them very easily, end up with something that's very robust. So in contrast, when we're doing fiberglass layups ourselves, we're starting with a fiberglass fabric. So it's going to look more like, like this. So they've taken this very fine fiberglass thread, woven it into a fabric and we get, you know, it's still a fabric, it's almost silky, right? It's, it's very soft, very pliable, but it is made up of these little tiny fiberglass threads. So again, we're going to create a composite taking this fiberglass fabric several layers thick if we need to combine that with the laminating epoxy which is going to excuse me sir? yes so sorry to interrupt uh, sure. your video is turned off my video is off oh boy let's see actually not able to get back to the meeting controls here. Let's see what I can do here. So you might find it on the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen. Yeah. My, uh, my video is not, is not um, turned off. Just try uh, turning it off and then back on. So. Yeah, let's try that. All right, can you see me now? Yes, sir. That's clear. Can you see me now? Okay, good. Um, so you did. You probably didn't see any of any of what I showed, right? Yes, sir. We okay. Let me see if I if I uh, share the screen again. And can you still see the slideshow? Yes, sir. We could still see the slides. Okay. All right. So can you now? Can you see the slides and see me? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's great, sir. Good. All right, so just a little restart it kind of thing. But um, so anyway, I was um, what I was showing was again. So there's in the slideshow we have the picture on the left, which is a, a fiberglass rocket that's made from a kit. Uh, this is what it looks like after it's it's completed and painted. But um, fiberglass fins, they're solid fiberglass made from uh, fiberglass fabric sheets, right? Very solid. That's what we end up with. Um, in contrast, what we're working with when we do our a, a home layup or you know a, a home project is we're working with uh, fiberglass fabric. Looks like this. It's very soft. It's it's like an almost silky cloth, and it's made up of these very fine. Pull one out here. Very fine fiberglass strings they're very soft so, you know so we think of glass as like very brittle and fragile this is actually very soft you know we can mold it around shapes that we want to create we uh, lay it up with the uh, epoxy the laminating epoxy and it becomes very strong so uh, there i have a, a picture of a fin that's started with plywood the plywood is optional i mean you could do this at home even laying up you know you could make solid fiberglass plate fins for example um, and that just blinked. Do you, can you guys still see me okay on the? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, good. Um, 
So what I did with that one in the photo, I started with uh, plywood. Plywood's good to start with because it's very easy to cut the shape. Um, have the fiberglass fabric on either side, added the, the epoxy, and we'll talk more in details about how to do that. But um, so what we're ending up with is a fiberglass reinforced plywood. Now at home, we could also, if you wanted to, just stack up multiple layers of the fabric until you achieve the thickness that you want. And again, that would be saturated with the uh, laminating epoxy, which would harden and cure, and you would get your final fiberglass product. Okay, so uh, we talked a little bit about the fiberglass fabric. Uh, the glass is drawn into very, very fine, almost, you know, probably finer than human hair threads, you know, by the appearance of it. It's woven into a cloth that we can shape around uh, a mandrel or a mold, something to give us the shape that we want and it's sold in various weights. So this one is um, our you know, ridiculous overcomplicated units that we use in the United States, three ounces per uh, square yard, which is about hundred grams per square meter. So this is a, a very fine thread kind. This is good for conforming to shapes if we're making nose cones or if we want the outer part of a build that's going to be the part that we sand and paint. You know, this is a very fine fabric. Uh, also, there's uh, this is six ounce fabric. So this would be something like 200 grams per uh, square meter. Um, it's a little more coarse. It's thicker. So this is what we'd be using for uh, structural, you know, for making a body tube and we're trying to build up several layers for strength. We could use this more coarse material and uh, possibly top it with the finer material that we can finish and paint. Okay, so again, the fiberglass component, it's just the very fine thread woven into a fabric. Uh, some alternatives to the fiberglass, uh, carbon fiber. Again, it, it's, it's kind of like a fabric. Aramid, which is, it's the same class of chemical as what's used in bullet resistant vests and uh, flame resistant suits for pilots. So it's a pretty abrasion resistant, you know, it goes under a trade name Kevlar here. But uh, it's just a fabric, you know, again, you can, it's, it works the same way. The, the process is the same as the fiberglass. You have a fabric, you add that to a mandrel or a mold to give it the shape. You add your laminating epoxy, which then cures and hardens. And you get your final product in the, in the shape that you want. Uh, the body tube sock, uh, that's another option. It's kind of like that um, uh, medical patients where you're trying to control swelling, you can slide that over, you know, say a, a, an arm or a leg that's swelling. You can stretch it over a cardboard tube, for example. Let me grab an example of that real quick. This one's a little, a little bigger. But see, this is this kind of uh, stretching material. I stretched it over a cardboard tube, added the epoxy, and when that hardens, it's going to be you know a composite. It's going to be a, a very durable composite, kind of like if we had fiberglass. The the sock, you know, this, this elastic material is easy to work with with um, body tube, a cylindrical shape. So that's an option too. So again, the process is the same. You know, fiberglass, carbon fiber, aramid something like the body tube sock, which is more for ease. Um, but there's some other options there. And I thought we had a question in the chat. Let me see if I can. Okay. Looks like no questions. Can you still see me okay? Yes, sir. We can still see you. Good deal. All right. Let's move on then. Okay, so we talked about the fiberglass cloth component. Now the other part of the equation is the laminating epoxy. So this is a, a specialized low viscosity epoxy in contrast to like structural epoxy that we, we would use to assemble the airframe, say attaching fins, for example. This is different, it's special laminating epoxy. And we use it to saturate the fiberglass cloth. And then again, once that fiberglass and uh, epoxy cure, it becomes a strong composite. So there's uh, the epoxy is a further a two part components. There's a, usually a resin and a hardener. So we mix the resin with the hardener and then together they react and um, 
create a, you know, a hard structure. So the, the photo here is a couple different brands of uh, laminating epoxy systems that I've used. Um, I don't, you know, the brand is probably not so important, but what is important is the hardener. There are diff usually different hardeners available in each system. And the difference amongst the hardeners is how fast they cure. So uh, a, a big uh, deciding factor there in which hardener you use, one of those is the, the working temperature that you have. So where I live, uh, it gets pretty cold in the winter. I do this in a basement that's not heated, so it gets chilly down there. Um, I use a faster hardener in those conditions because it has a wider acceptable working temperature range. So this fast hardener that I use in the winter time can be used down to about five degrees Celsius, which is pretty chilly, but the slower hardeners might need more like 20 degrees Celsius for them to cure properly. So that's a factor. You need to think about what kind of environment you're going to be working in and select your hardener to an extent based on that. I generally recommend for rockets, use the slowest hardener you can get away with because it's going to give you the most working time and is also gonna help out with some safety considerations that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So um, just a quick recap, the fiberglass composite that we're creating that we're building the rocket out of, we have the fiberglass fabric and also the laminating epoxy that go together to make the composite. All right, so let's talk some safety notes. Uh, some important safety notes on this one. Um, we're working with the laminating epoxy. Epoxy cures, it's an exothermic reaction. It produces its own heat. But again, heat also helps the epoxy cure faster. So if the epoxy is producing its own heat and heat is also helping it cure, you can see how you can get this positive feedback loop and run into a problem and run into this uh, you know, flash over you know, therm thermal runaway, get dangerously hot as a matter of fact. Uh, to illustrate the point, uh, today I mixed up a small batch of uh, epoxy with the fast hardener and I just put it in a cup. And you can see, easily melted the cup, right? It got quite hot. Uh, this is uh, the cup that I mixed in before and after. So we need to be aware that it's an exothermic reaction, especially with the fast hardeners. Now with the slow hardeners, I just, you know, do it, you know, mix it up and work right out of the cup. With the fast hardeners, however, we can use um, a wider tray. So for example, I could mix it up and then dump it into this larger tray. This is just a, the bottom of a milk jug. So in the United States, they sell milk in these like one gallon, you know, approximately four liter plastic containers. Cut the bottom off, pour it in there. And what that does is it gives a more surface area so that heat can dissipate. If you have this like kind of mass of epoxy, the heat doesn't really have anywhere to go. And it'll heat up pretty quickly and suddenly and this thermal runaway problem can happen and when i mix this up uh, you know again it's just a little cup uh, i'd say for about the first seven or eight minutes it stayed liquid it wasn't too bad and then right around eight or nine minutes it started getting really thick and then right at around 10 minutes very quickly it got really hot and melted the cup so that's something to be aware of again if you can use a slower hardener if you can get away with that with your conditions that's that's the way to go. It's going to give you more working time and you're going to be less likely to run into this kind of problem. Okay, so that's um, a safety consideration with the epoxy. Also the fumes, you want to work in a well ventilated area. The epoxies, the, you know, the odors aren't too, uh, too bad. Uh, an alternative you might see in fiberglass layups, especially with, you know, boats, for example, is this polyester resin. Um, that's used pretty commonly in fiberglass layups, but um, it's a little more brittle and it's also the, the, the odors are, are nasty. They're, you know, it's flammable, it's toxic. You know, you, you're better off using the epoxy as opposed to the polyester if you can get it. Uh, respiratory hazards, um, if we're got our cured product and we're sanding on it, we're actually shearing off little tiny fiberglass, you know, little glass strands if we're inhaling those, you know, the glass is very chemically resistant. So if we get it in our lungs, that's not good. It's gonna be hard for your lungs to deal with that. So we wanna protect our lungs. So I use when I'm, you know, sanding or grinding or cutting cured fiberglass. Uh, this is a P100 mask. So the 100 indicates it's something like a, a 99.7 filtering efficiency. So, you know, when I'm doing that type of work, 
I'm protecting my lungs with a mask, okay? I mean, you know, not the surgical kind of mask we've been seeing lately. You want like a, you know, a, a robust particular mask so you're not breathing these glass, you know, little fragments and epoxy dust. Uh, the splash hazard, you know, when you mix up the liquid epoxy, you don't want to get that in your eyes. So I wear safety glasses when I'm doing that. All right, so got my mask, I've got my safety glasses, so I don't get the, you don't want that stuff in your eyes. It's sticky, it's nasty. You get it in your eyes, you're going to be not happy. So protect your eyes. And also the uh, the dermal protection, protect your skin. So it's it's sticky, it's, you know, you don't want it on your skin, you're not going to like it. But beyond that, some people, you know, have a rarely, but some people do have a pretty strong allergic reaction to epoxies in general. So um, when I'm working with the liquid epoxies, I'm also wearing uh, rubber gloves, right? Protecting the skin. So protect your lungs, your eyes, your skin. Okay, all hazards we need to be aware of. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, this is a little bit of an extreme case. Uh, this is a guy that flies with uh, the rocket club that I fly with. Um, he uh, reportedly has a you know rather strong allergic reaction to the fiberglass work. So you see he's got himself pretty well decked up there. He's got a full face respirator and a chemical suit. Um, he's got this challenge. He's got an allergy, but he's decided that it's not going to stop him from doing the hobby that he loves. So he went full out and got the full suit and his neighbors must think he's a wacko, but uh, he is happy. You can see on the far right, he's been quite successful. So uh, he's a, a very prolific builder and flyer, makes his own propellants and he has not let this little allergy uh, thing stop him. So again, that's, that's probably more extreme than most people need, but the point is there are health hazards involved. You need to protect yourself. Um, Let's talk a little bit about fins. I mean, this is something that happened a couple of weeks ago at a club event. Um, we'll call it maybe not so much as an incident as a learning experience, but it has to do with composites. So it's applicable to today's topic. So let's talk about it briefly. Uh, the story behind this photo is we're at a, a club gathering. Um, sometimes we'll have a little friendly race. Two guys will uh, fly two rockets at the same time. See who can go the highest, right? So in this case, we've got two rockets that are almost identical. These are about 130 centimeters diameter, so not small rockets. Uh, fiberglass airframe. If you look at the body tube closely, you can probably see that fiberglass weave, that you know diagonal woven pattern. And it's got carbon fiber composite fins, right? So both rockets launched on an L850 motor, so L, L impulse with about 850 newtons of thrust. So that's quite a bit of power, you know, at the amateur level. But uh, two almost identical rockets launched at the same time. The difference was one of the rockets had fins of thickness about five millimeters. The other had fins of thickness about three millimeters, both carbon fiber. So as these two rockets accelerated through about a thousand kilometers per hour, you see all three fins on this one with the thinner three millimeter thin material all broke. And it's the carbon fiber that broke. It's, it didn't break at the joints. We can see that the guy that built this rocket, he actually did a really nice job constructing it. He used the through the wall fin construction that we've talked about where you know we have the slot in the body tube, goes you know, the fin material goes through the body tube and actually epoxies onto the motor mount. He's got really nice fillets. So where he, where the root edge of the, um, the fin meets the body tube, he's got that reinforced with a lot of epoxy. We call that a fillet. He did a really nice job building it. But what got him uh, is what's called fin, fin flutter, which occurs at high speed. I'm not gonna get too much into that. Uh, I put a couple little um, links for some additional reading if you'd like to learn more about that. But the point is simply that our materials need to be robust. So if we're building up our materials, say fins, for example, um, need to be plenty thick. How thick is thick enough? Well, it depends on how hard you intend to push your rocket, what materials you're using. And it depends on the quality of the layout job that you did when you created that composite. So um, again, this one, uh, this is about five millimeters thick uh, solid fiberglass. So it's pretty, pretty robust, but um, the point is simply that, you know, especially working with high performance rockets, your materials need to be robust. Okay. 
All right, so we've talked about our materials, we've talked about our safety, let's get to work here. So first we're going to cover our work surface. This stuff is, you know, the epoxy is sticky, it's messy, you're going to get drips. So I take a big cardboard box, I flatten it out and cover the floor where I'm going to work. So when I drip, it's on the cardboard, no problem. Um, before you start, you want to have all your pieces of fabric cut to shape because once you mix your epoxy, it starts curing and the, the clock is running. So you want to have everything laid out and organized, ready to go before you mix epoxy. Um, if you're going to use the, uh, the fiberglass as your, as your structure, I'd say go with you know, at least five or six layers of the, you know, what would be uh, equivalent to about 200 grams per square meter fiberglass. Um, start small, start with a smaller rocket. You don't, you don't want to start on something like this. You want to start something, you know, substantially smaller, both from a, you know, a flying safety standpoint. And also if it doesn't go so well, you haven't invested a ton of money and materials and time on it. Okay. So start small, but, you know, plan to do a good, you know, at least five or six layers of fiberglass to get a good solid structure. Um, for body tubes, we want to have our mandrel ready to go and we want to have our fiberglass laid out nice and straight. So when we roll this fabric around a cylindrical mandrel to give it its shape, you need to go nice and straight the first time. It, 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 you know, intuitively you would think like if it starts getting wrinkles, you can just straighten it out. It's, it's much better to just get it right the first time, roll it on nice and straight the first time because it'll just feel like it's fighting you once you uh, get going. So you want to have it, you know, your mandrel and your sheet of fiberglass fabric laid out nice and straight so you can just roll it on nice and nice and smooth the first time. Go a little bit at a time, just advance it a little bit at a time, make sure it stays nice and smooth and straight as you roll it up. All right, and you also want to have extra tools. You want to have extra gloves. You're, 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 you're going to get this stuff on your fingers. You want to be able to change your gloves if you need to. Have extra paint brushes. So um, I had a paint brush here, but just apply this with a regular little cheapo paint brush. Uh, use you know, something disposable because it's, it's going to be nasty and sticky. So plan on using a paint brush that you can dispose of. Uh, let's see if we have a chat here. Okay. Um, peel ply, vacuum bags, we'll talk about that in subsequent slides, but the point is you just wanna have everything nice and organized and ready to go before you mix your epoxy. All right, um, keep in mind that before the epoxy cures, this is the, the fiberglass and the epoxy are going to have no structure whatsoever. This is gonna be a wet rag so you need to have something that can support it and give it shape. So if you're using, if you're creating a body tube, you need to start with a cylinder that you can wrap that fabric around and you need to keep it supported up off the floor. So in this uh, previous slide, if you can see, you can see it a little bit in this photo, but uh, there's a PVC structure that I've made that is kind of like a little tripod with a pole that goes in either end of the body tube. So I can support it off the floor while the epoxy is curing, all right? Uh, you know, any, anything you need to prepare, if you need to sand anything smooth or have anything, you know, cut to shape, you want that all ready to go before you start mixing your epoxy. All right, so now let's talk about mixing the epoxy. The ratio with these laminating epoxies is really crucial. They're very unforgiving to an improperly measured out mix ratio and an improperly mixed job. So you need to mix it really thoroughly also. So look at your specific product, read the instructions. Do you, do you mix it by weight? Do you mix it by volume? It can be different for each product. So if we look at this photo, this cup of epoxy that I have here, you can see the, the lighter colored liquid at the bottom of the cup, that's the resin. The more brownish liquid at the top is the hardener. You see they're a different density. They have separated out. So if you're measuring by volume, it may not be the same ratio as if you're mixing based on weight. So in this case, I'm using a scale to measure it out very accurately out to the tenth of a gram. Uh, but you need to know what's your ratio. It's going to be different for every product. So you need to read the instructions and know that before you start pouring things. And then mix it thoroughly. If you don't have it really thoroughly mixed, 
you're going to end up with little sticky uncured spots in your rocket and it's going to be a mess. So you have your cup there, you know, you're using, um, you know, a stir stick, make sure you're hitting the corners, getting the, you know, getting the corners all mixed up, mix it really thoroughly. Make sure the hardener and the, and the uh, resin all come into contact very uh, uniform. Okay. So um, if we're going to say, for example, create a body tube, and we're doing that around a mandrel, you know, a cylinder that's going to give it its shape. The first layer we need to put on is something that we can peel off, something that the epoxy is not going to be able to stick to. So mylar sheet, cellophane, wrap those around the mandrel before you start adding epoxy and your fiberglass. Now, another option, if you're using, say, a cardboard tube, like what I've done with this one, is to just leave the cardboard tube as part of the airframe. So that's what's going to happen on this rocket. The cardboard is going to stay as part of the rocket. It's going to fly too. The fiberglass is permanently um, cured onto it. It's going to it's it's all one structure now. But that's fine for you know what I'm doing with this rocket. It's just kind of a hobby, uh, you know, sport thing. If you were going to do something, say high performance, like you're going to compete, maybe you want to, you know, if you're going into a ten thousand meter competition, you're going to need all the performance you can get you might want to remove that carbon or that uh, cardboard tube to save as much weight as you can. If you plan to do that, you need to start by adding something, you know, a layer that the epoxy is not going to stick to so you can pull that mandrel out after the epoxy cures. So that's your first step. Uh, once you get that on there, you can lay a nice even coat, you know, with a paintbrush of your laminating epoxy and then lay your fiberglass around it. Again, get it nice and straight the first time if you don't, you know, if you're getting wrinkles, fix them before you move on and do the next layer. Because once you start getting wrinkles and things getting uneven, it's, it's practically impossible to fix it. So take your time, roll it on nice and straight, and then wet out the fiberglass. So as you roll the fiberglass onto the epoxy, you're going to see it soak through. Take some more fiber, uh, take some more epoxy and take that brush and dab it, work it in there, get it nice and fully saturated. That's called the wet out process. Right. Um, squeezy off any extra that's you know you can do that with a brush or you can take a rubber squeegee the point of that is is we want the fiberglass fabric and the epoxy at a certain ratio we just want just enough to saturate the fabric so any extra fi any extra epoxy is not adding strength it's just adding weight so we want to try to get the the fabric fully wetted out and saturated but no more so, you know, with a home project, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but we want to do the best we can. So, you know, brush off or squeegee off any extra epoxy to the extent that you can. All right. Um, to, to an extent, if, if you need to move the fiberglass around a little bit, you can just, you know, brush it with the brush and it'll, it'll move a little bit. But again, you, you really want to try to get it straight the first time. Okay. Uh, peel ply is optional, but it's really helpful stuff. So, uh, this is peel ply. It just looks like a, another fabric, but it's like a nylon, but it doesn't stick to the epoxy well. So what this does is if you've applied your epoxy and it's not quite even, right, you lay this over your top layer of fiberglass and saturate this with epoxy too. When the epoxy cures, this will peel right off and take that uneven epoxy away with it. So then you don't really have any extra epoxy. So what I've done here on this uh, example, I started with just a piece of plywood. When I, when I laid this up, just kind of for this example, I took the piece of plywood, added a layer of epoxy, put my layer of fiberglass cloth, and then added the peel ply, and then saturated the peel ply with epoxy too. When the epoxy cures, you can just peel that, carefully peel that peel ply away and what you're left with is this very flat surface, but it's got a slight texture to it too, which is good for when we add our primer to do our paint job. It gives a slightly roughened surface that the primer can adhere to. So the peel ply is advantageous for a few reasons. One, it makes a, a nice level surface, assuming you got the peel ply nice and smooth when you applied it. The epoxy is going to take whatever shape the, the peel ply has. So if the peel ply has a wrinkle, you're going to have a ridge in your epoxy that you're going to have to sand out later. No problem, but you know if you get it smooth the first time, it's less work later. 
Um, also, what it can help with is managing a phenomenon called amine blush. So what may occur, especially if you're working in humid conditions, your epoxy might cure nice and fully and properly, but you might end up with this kind of sticky layer that just seems like it never fully cures. That's the amine blush. Assuming you've got your mix ratio correct, you've done the mix you know, thoroughly, you've done everything else with good practices, and you're still ending up with this sticky layer, um, what will happen is, is that layer, that amine blush layer will form on the outside of the peel ply. So when you peel the peel ply off, it'll take the amine blush away with it. And you'll be left with a nice hard, um, not sticky, you know, feels nice and fully cured result. Um, again, the peel ply is optional. Another way to manage the amine blush is it is water soluble. So if you, you know, you've You've done your mix ratio correct. You've done a thorough mix. You applied your epoxy. You've given it plenty of time to cure. You still have this tacky, sticky surface on the outside. If you just scrub it off with plain water, it will come off. But it's it's one more step, and the peel ply can help manage that as, and also give you a nice smooth surface. So, again, the peel ply is optional, but it's it's helpful. Um, the vacuum bag. Uh, for, for like a really nice professional result, this is the way to do it. Um, I knew a guy that uh, he made uh, prosthetic limbs for people that are missing an arm or a leg. He made the attachment point out of carbon fiber. And he showed me these carbon fiber products that he made and they were just absolutely gorgeous, smooth, glossy. And I said, man, how did you do this? And he says, well, it's, it's carbon fiber, lay, fiber layup with a vacuum bag. So what the deal with the vacuum bag is, is you, you apply your epoxy to your, uh, your fabric. And then when you apply a vacuum, it sucks out all the air bubbles. It packs all the, all the layers of fabric right down to your mold and it packs the layers of fiberglass together. So it, you end up with this really solid high density result. Um, it, it takes some more equipment. So you need a vacuum pump. You're gonna need to fabricate a plastic bag. It's not something that I personally do, you know, just because it's extra equipment and I'm doing this at home but for a really good, you know, solid top notch result, look into the vacuum bag. I'm not going to go much more into that, uh, but uh, I'll just leave you that if, you know, it's something to look into, uh, especially for, for simple parts. Like if you want to make your own fiberglass sheet and then you're laying out uh, pieces of fabric to make a fiberglass plate, when you apply that vacuum, it's going to pack them all down really nice and tight. Uh, so you end up with a really nice solid result. All right. Okay, so after we've applied our epoxy, we give it a certain amount of time to cure. That's going to depend on the hardener you used, but uh, we allow the epoxy to cure to what's called the leather stage. So it's, it's mostly cured, but it's still kind of flexible. That's a good point where we can trim off excess. So at that point, it's pretty easy to take just um, like a, red, a regular razor knife like this. And we can go around the edges and trim off the excess. So here I've, you know, just for example, I've trimmed off the excess there and I'm left with a nice, sharp, clean edge. You know, again, using a knife, a little safety, safety pointer as you're cutting, you know, cut away from yourself. So you wouldn't want to be holding it like this and cutting this direction towards your fingers. Your knife slips, bad news. So be conscious of your cutting direction. But at the leather stage, that's a good time to trim off excess. That's when it's going to be easiest, all right? So allow the epoxy to fully cure. You know, if you're using a really slow hardener, that may take several days, maybe even a week before it's like really, really solid. It's going to depend on the hardener you chose and your temperature conditions. Uh, remove the amine blush if necessary, we, like we talked. If you didn't use the peel ply, you, that can be managed with just some plain water and some scrubbing, a little more water will take care of it and sand if you need to, okay? Uh, tip to tip fin reinforcement. So uh, we created our fins. Maybe you made that out of solid fiberglass plate. Maybe you started with plywood and reinforced it with fiberglass. But another way, once you build your airframe, right? So you've got your structural epoxy attached your fins to your body tube. You can take additional layers of fiberglass and go from fin tip to fin tip. So. I would take a, fiber, a, a fiberglass fabric, one piece, and lay it all the way across. Let's see if I can do this on the camera. 
but you know, and you would do a, a nicer job of cutting this too. But like, once you've got your um, fins attached with structural epoxy, you can go all the way across and build up several layers like that, going across the fin, across the fin root, across the body tube, across the opposing fin root onto the opposing fin, build up several layers like that. And you end up with this, you know, kind of almost monolithic structure. You can get some a really nice uh, airframe with really strong fins using the uh, tip to tip fiberglass fin reinforcement. Works the same way. You would add, add some liquid uh, epoxy, apply your fabric, wet it out with more, um, more epoxy, and then peel apply if, if you're gonna go that route, let that cure. All right, so now let's talk nose cones. This is where it gets a little tricky because now we're not just doing the simple flat shape like a fin or a relatively simple cylinder like a body tube. We've got a little more of a three-dimensional shape we have to deal with. So there's a few ways to go about uh, creating that shape. Um, you know, if you have ability to work on a lathe and you can make a blank out of, you know, wood at the shape you want, that's an option. And then create the mold out of fiberglass, you know, make an actual fiberglass mold. Uh, the way that I do it is since I have access to a 3D printer, I just 3D print, you know, what I, the shape that I want. So I'm going to create a negative of the nose cone. So this is one, um, what it looks like. So basically I've just 3D printed the negative of the nose cone that I want. So after I've sanded this smooth, I'm gonna use some uh, automotive primer to uh, get it really nice and smooth. I'm gonna hit it with some progressively finer sandpaper until it's all, I'm almost like a polished surface. That's gonna give me a nice surface on the nose cone. When it's done, it's also gonna make it easier to pull the nose cone away from the mold if it's nice and smooth, right? But I would take, I would have two of these molds. I would lay my fabric in the mold. And that, you know, once I have my epoxy, that will conform to the shape of that mold and it'll cure in that shape. So we talked about the leather stage a little bit. We could apply our epoxy, let it cure to the leather stage, put these two halves together, clamp them together, turn this over, add some more epoxy and fiberglass strips along the seam and we ended up with a pretty nice solid uh, fiberglass nose cone. So I'm gonna just, it's, it's a little bit off topic, but it's, it's kind of part of the workflow. So I'm gonna see if I can uh, show some, a little bit of Onshape. I use a, a, a 3D CAD program called Onshape, which is free for hobby use. So that's a, a great way to get started if you haven't uh, done any 3D CAD. Uh, it's pretty intuitive to use, so I'm going to see if I can um, show that. And hopefully it hasn't logged me out by now, but if it, yeah, it has, but we'll, we'll fix that. Okay, so can, every, can we see the, uh, the, the picture of the, the mold in, in 3D CAD? Yes, sir. All right, perfect. So it's pretty simple. Um, you know, again, this uh, software is pretty intuitive, pretty easy to learn, but we're gonna start with uh, what's called a sketch. And it's just, um, you know, a, a two dimensional image of, of a half of a nose cone. And then we're going to revolve that around an axis, right? So then we get, you know, basically half of a nose cone and then we can add this box around it. And then with this Boolean tool, we can just subtract the nose cone shape from the box, 3D print that, and then we got it made. Um, I also add a couple little ridges on there, um, a negative ridge and a positive ridge along either side. So that way, when I go to join the two halves, I've got this groove that I can line up with this ridge, they line up nicely. I put my clamps on there and then I can work easily. Okay. So again, that's just um, real quick introduction to how I did that. But um, if you have access to a, you know, a 3D printer, that's a really easy way to do it. <clears throat> so we'll go back to the slideshow here. All right, so hopefully we're back to the slides at this point. Um, 
So we went through those steps. Um, again, you would, you know, with your with your two mold halves, you would, you know, build up, you know, start with, you know, maybe six, seven layers of fiberglass on your first go. Start with something small. So again, you're not investing lots of materials if it doesn't go well the first time, but you know, probably will. But uh, start with, you know, a good six or seven layers, wet them out thoroughly. Um, before you, I should have mentioned this earlier, before you apply your uh, epo your first layer of epoxy to your mold, you wanna use a, a mold release wax or a PVC spray. So you can separate the epoxy from the mold. It's gonna make, you know, make your life a lot easier that you can pull the mold away from the, the part that you just created. So you wanna put that release wax on before you start. And again, as always, before you start mixing epoxy, have all your fiberglass strips cut. Um, Tricky part with the nose cone is the tip. If you have a, a you know really pointed nose cone, um, I would take a, a circle of the fabric, cut it radially. So then once you have these halves joined, and you can you know stuff that down in there. Use a you know a stick, you know wood. You know this is just simple wood stick that I use. This is actually leftover chopstick from a Chinese restaurant. Doesn't have to be anything complicated, but you can use that to help you get that nose cone fabric down in there. Uh, work the seams, fabric along the seams. You can also put a little bit of liquid fiberglass down in the tip. Again, um, slow hardener recommended for that. You don't want masses of epoxy that are going to cure fast and get really hot. Also, I print my molds out of ABS plastic as opposed to PLA or um, you know other filaments. Reason I use the ABS is because it's got a good temperature resistance. So if it does get a little hot, the ABS is a little more durable. And also the durability factor. Once you get this mold nice and sanded and smooth and you have it how you want it, you can use it to make as many copies of that nose cone as you want. So a little durability helps it go a long way. All right. Another option for the nose cone, this is, um, this is one that I did with an aluminum tip. So this is actually from a kit, but um, for the ones that I do myself, uh, you can you know, leave off the tip and use this machined aluminum tip, which gives it, you know, it's really strong, gives it a kind of a kind of a cool look. But um, the way that works is this, this is an example of the machined aluminum tip. Um, it's got a threaded hole in the back with a bolt and a washer. So you would put this in, install this before you put your shoulder and all your other, you know, once it's all sealed up inside, you need to get this in there first. But that's a that's a nice option for you know larger high power rockets and it's all you know again the tip of the nose cone is tricky that's another way to deal with it <clears throat> all right so again you lay up your nose cone halves uh, you know combine your two halves put your uh, extra fiberglass along the seams add some reinforcement to the tip maybe add a little epoxy to the tip and then you can let that cure, separate the molds, and then you got your nose cone. All right. A um, couple little other little pointers for making the nose cone. It's good to have uh, some thickened epoxy with these um, little challenging little. This is where the um, the shoulder meets the uh, the body tube. So, for example, on this one again, <clears throat> um, we've got the nose cone. And then the shoulder, this is the part that slides down inside the body tube. So you've got this little ridge that's kind of difficult to deal with when you're doing the cloth. So if you make some thickened epoxy, you can make some thickened epoxy by just taking some um, fiberglass cloth, pull the fibers away, cut it up into little tiny pieces, make a bunch of that and mix that up with some epoxy. You get a really nice thickened epoxy that you can work into that groove and it'll help reinforce that that sharp edge. All right. Um, again, respira respiratory protection when you're doing that, when you're dealing with all these little tiny slivers of uh, fiberglass, you don't want to be breathing that. So respiratory protection. All right. Um, we talked about the amming blush. We talked about, you know, creating the shoulder. Um, went over all that. So at that point, you know, we've got our fins made, we've got our body tube made, we've got our nose cone, we've, we've got all the structural parts that we need. So now it's just, you know, sanding it if we need to, um, hit it with the, the primer. This is a, an automotive primer. It's got a high solids content. So we can do that before we paint, apply some primer. 
sand that nice and smooth and then we can shoot our paint and uh, we end up with hopefully nice uh, there's the result okay so You know, it's one thing for me to talk through it, show you photos. It's another thing entirely for me to be able to watch somebody do it. So I've left some video links here. These are all on YouTube, so you can watch these all for free. Um, different aspects of the process. So uh, first couple of videos, if you wanna make a pure fiberglass tube without the mandrel inside, that's what those first two videos are for. Um, there's also a couple of examples of where you're gonna reinforce a cardboard tube and keep the cardboard as part of the airframe. That's represented here. Uh, steps involved in making a fiberglass nose cone. This video that I showed here is uh, part two of a two part series. So this is where he's actually laying up the nose cone in the mold. In part one of that video, if you're interested, he goes over how to create a mold from say, a wood nose cone that he turned on a lathe. If you wanna see that process too. That's part one that goes to that video. I um, also included a video on the, the tip to tip fin reinforcement. So if you're gonna go, if you're gonna try this, you know, I'd recommend you watch the videos too. It's, again, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to see somebody actually do it. So some good resources there. All right, so we've, we've talked materials, we've talked safety, you know, if, the safety part, if, if you don't get anything else out of this talk, please let that be the part that you take away with you. Um, you know, remember, protect your eyes, protect your skin, protect your lungs. Um, we talked materials, uh, the processes involved. So I'm sure there are questions. So um, why don't we uh, take some questions now? If you have some questions, let's uh, open up the chat. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And thank you again for the experiences and the knowledge you shared with us today. And let's move on to the Q&A session. Uh, over to you, Hassan. Yes, uh, indeed, that was a very, very valuable session. So now we have a link which was already shared in the chat where you can post all your questions and uh, we would pick out the questions to be asked from Mr. Josh here. Uh, please do note that we do have a time frame so all not all questions can be entertained today but don't worry we'll try our best so um, we do have a question to be going on so the first question would be how to connect parachute to the body of ejection okay so uh good question um let me grab a, let me grab something real quick that i have here handy i'm gonna i'm gonna go over and do some visuals let me just grab something real quick <clears throat> Okay, so most most secure way. This is a this is a motor mount that I'm working on for another project. Uh, this one is not fiberglass, but it's a cardboard tube motor mount with plywood centering rings. So this inner tube is is where you would slide your motor in, and then these outer centering rings would be epoxy to the body tube. Okay, so in that forward farther most you know front centering ring, I just have a stainless steel eyeball it goes through that front centering ring. I've got some epoxy on the back side. So the hardware, the nut that is threaded on there doesn't come out because once this is once this is installed in the rocket, it's it's all epoxied in place. There's no going back and reattaching that. So I've got some epoxy on the threads. And uh, this is just anchored into that front centering ring. Now with that there before you install this, because again, once it's in there, you might not be able to reach it. I'm gonna tie on some Kevlar cord, okay? Um, you can see on this, on this one, this is the nose cone end, right? So on this one, I've got some, uh, this is 2000 pound Kevlar cord tied on to this stainless steel eye bolt. Um, that's, gonna, that's gonna work for high power rocketry, okay? Um, low power rocketry, uh, we don't usually go that robust. Uh, you can just kind of take and um, we'll take a little bit of shot cord material and some paper, fold it over a few times and just glue it inside the body tube. That's fine for little rockets on the order of, you know, this big made out of cardboard uh, body tubes and such. 
But for you know the bigger stuff, the high power stuff, we're going with things like stainless steel hardware anchored into the centering ring of the motor mount. That's the most secure way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir, there's another question. Is fiberglass harmful to the environment? Um, it's, you know, chemically, no, it's very inert. The, the thing that makes it environmentally difficult to deal with, like we said, it's very chemically resistant. So it doesn't really degrade. You know, if you're putting it in a landfill, for example, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be there for a long time. The epoxy component is probably the more environmental impact part. So, you know, if you're getting epoxy, you wanna dispose of that properly. Probably if you have some extra that you, that you wanna get rid of, probably the most responsible way to deal with it would be to just mix up the hardener and the resin and let it harden and manage it that way. But um, the fiberglass, you know, chem the fiberglass itself, you know, the fabric, it's just glass. You know, it's, it's the same as the glass in like a window. So chemically it's not harmful, but again, it's, it's gonna take a very long time to break down in the environment. So uh, we have another question as well. By using fiber class, the weight of the rocket will be affected. So will it have any effect to the launching of the rocket? Definitely. Um, so, you know, let's go, let's go back all the way to the basics. So one of the first things we talked about, and, and that's a good question, um, a good safety critical question is, um, we have to have enough thrust to weight ratio to accelerate our rocket to a, a fast enough speed that our fins are effective to keep the rocket stable before it leaves the launch rail. Um, I'll say, so let's back up a step. So uh, we about a month ago, uh, SEDS ran a virtual competition, a virtual rocket design competition. And that was one of the things that went into the competition. I was I was fortunate to get to evaluate some of those. The ones that I evaluated, everybody did a really nice job of choosing the, a, a proper motor that had enough thrust to accelerate the mass that they were trying to launch. Okay, so um, that competition demanded some pretty large motors, and everybody everybody keyed in on that. Everybody got the safety critical stuff right. So everybody did a great. No, thanks to everybody that participated in that. By the way. Um, I saw a lot of, obviously a lot of thought and effort went into it, but you know, the key thing there is you have to have enough thrust for the weight for the mass of the rocket that you're trying to move. And that goes back, you know, to the open rocket session that we did uh, last session, that software can help you figure those things out. So if you're building your rocket in a software program like open rocket, and you say, you know, you're, you're designating your parts, in the software, you specify your materials. So there's a drop down list, you know, there's cardboard, there's fiberglass, plywood, whatever. It's got the densities of all these different materials, and you also specify the thickness. And from that, the software is going to calculate the estimated mass of your rocket. So now, when you install a simulated motor in that rocket in the software, run the simulation, the software is going to tell you, yeah, you got enough velocity leaving the rail, or you don't. So great question, um, but it is extra mass. It's going to take more thrust to get it moving. So that's a good point. Uh, yes, there's another question, sir. Uh, how much heat will the fiberglass resist? How much heat will it resist? Um, I don't know. As far as like a, a melting point, um, what I can tell you is that it's, it's plenty robust to deal with the temperatures that, we, that it will encounter in rocketry. Um, if you're getting up into, you know, and this is not a beginner topic, but if you're getting into well into the supersonic realm where, um, you know, surface heating, frictional heating is, is becoming a big factor, you're at a, you're at a much more advanced level. And, uh, you know, fiberglass is going gonna, is gonna to do just fine up, into, up, up to like, you know, the most extreme applications. So... Um, you know, again, fiberglass is a really good durable way to go, both from an impact resistance and a temperature resistance uh, standpoint. 
So uh, there's another question. What is the durability of the fiberglass? Or how durable is the fiberglass? Um, it'll, it'll take a pretty good impact. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it, you know, parachutes fail. So it's, it's hitting the ground, you know, pretty much ballistically. And I mean, I've seen fiberglass rockets that are two meters long hit the ground at hundreds of kilometers per hour and bury themselves up to the fins in the soil and pull them out and they're still intact. So it's pretty tough. There's another question. Uh, what is the best chemical fuel to use as the rocket fuel? I'm sorry, as the fuel? Yes. Um, most, uh, most commonly you're going to see, um, so there's, there's two components. There's uh, fuel and an oxidizer. So the oxidizer is, is probably more what you're asking about. Uh, typically it's uh, ammonium perchlorate is the most common one and for the most, let's call it the most thrust for the weight of the motor, ammonium perchlorate is one of the best oxidizers out there. The fuel is, is uh, more of like a rubber substance. So when you cast the motor, um, you're going to have kind of a semi-liquid, semi-solid kind of stuff that you make and it's going to be a mixture of the ammonium perchlorate oxidizer with this kind of rubbery fuel. You're going to pack that into cylinders and let that cure in heart. But um, the uh, ammonium perchlorate is the most common one you're going to see. Yes, sir. By, the way, and, uh, by the way, sorry, that, sorry to cut you off there, but that's also what's used in, you know, orbital class uh, vehicles, you know, solid rocket boosters for orbital class uh, vehicles going into space. It's going to be a ammonium perchlorate chemistry. And uh, there's another question as well. Why can't we use a completed mold for the whole rocket? I mean, I, I suppose you could, but it would get pretty, pretty difficult. I mean, you, you're laying out this fabric and you need to have it all nice and smooth at one time. It'd be pretty challenging. The other aspect of it is, is when you go into your recovery, you need these different parts of the rocket to separate. So like you've got your parachute and your payload and stuff, everything contained inside the body tube. You're going to fire an ejection charge. that's going to separate the parts and then the parachute's going to be pushed out. So um, let me see if I can kind of visualize that for you, but this is the shot cord for this. This is not the complete rocket, but I'm just gonna to try to visualize this for you. Um, well, you would imagine, so this is, this is the body tube, the airframe. This is gonna slide inside here. And this shot cord is gonna be attached down inside internally and the parachute and all the recovery system is gonna be inside here. At the, at the proper time, an, a little explosive charge is gonna push this off. So we need to have it in separate parts. Um, that's one reason, but also just the layup would be really difficult to manage all that, um, all that fabric at the same time, sticky fabric and everything, get it all nice and smooth. It'd be really difficult. But, um, you know, again, functionally, we need multiple parts to make the rocket functional. Uh, this is the last question. Is there any way to build the nose cone without the 3D printed mold? Yeah, definitely. Um, any, anything that you can use to get the shape is, is uh, an option. So for example, I mentioned uh, some people might have a lathe and they can, turn, they can create that shape with wood on a lathe and then take fiberglass fabric and make a mold from that wooden part. And then you have a fiberglass mold and now you're gonna make your part, you know, your final part by laying more fiberglass fabric inside that fiberglass mold that you made. So basically anything you can do that's gonna give you the shape that you want and you can make it nice and smooth and you can wax it so you can release the mold from the final part will work, sure. You don't need a 3D printer to do it. So uh, very well, that brings us to the end of the Q&A session. And uh, we are all here spending a valuable time 
this early in the morning for Sri Lankans here and very, very late night for Mr. Josh here. So this is the moment to thank you all. So now I call upon the secretary of the project, Ravindu Sudharma, to deliver the word of thanks. Thank you. Uh, a very good point to everyone. Uh, I'm Ravindu Sudharma, secretary of Structure Rockets Project. Hope everyone had fantastic morning. As the first project of the newly opened committee of the SLTC Rocket Division, the structure of Rocket Session has brought our informative session on the Rocketry. I dream it great to honor to propose the word of thanks to all who have helped us in this make main webinar such as this only success. First of all, I would like to give my heartiest attitude to our guest speaker, the structure of Rocket's webinar, Mr. Josh Fissel, gracing with his presence and here sharing his valuable knowledge and experience with us here today. So thank you once again, Mr. Josh Fisher. I would like to express our profound gratitude to Dr. Nanda Gunawardhana, Director of Research and International Affairs. I would like to give my heartiest gratitude to Seth's Morotour. Also, massive appreciation goes to my fellow organizing committee members of the Rocket Division of ZSLDC and the moderator commitment and the hard work paid toward this project. You all did great work. Finally, I would like to thank all participants present here today. Thank you very much for your interest and valuable attention. At the CTSLDC, we are ready to be in both money program to stay with us. Thank you all and stay safe. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ravindu. So another day, another successful session. So stay tuned with SEDS and uh, we would promise you of bringing all the other valuable sessions as such that we had today. Hope you all had a fantastic morning and a wonderful session today. And with that note, signing off, I'm Hassan. Stay safe and healthy. Signing off, I'm Shanta. Have a good day, guys. Thank you.